sound like a good idea? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, unless guys are dripping in. All right. First star, who is actually a developer here? All right. Not too many. I work with a development team, but I'm okay. not a developer. No, okay. No, that, that doesn't matter, but uh, then uh, we know the level of presentation should be more general than diving into really coding stuff. Good. All right, let me first introduce uh, our, ourselves, uh, Arnold Daniels um, and Rick Smith. We're of the company Legal Things. Um, we run a company in contract automation. Uh, this started in 2014 as a digital platform to digitize contracts. Then clients started asking, can we maybe make those contracts uh, and all the steps behind that like accepting, signing, and stuff like that. Can we make that into workflows? So we made that. Um, then in 2016, they asked about blockchain. Can you do something about that? And we said, okay. Uh, remember, Hank was talking about those hashes. So we said, okay, we can actually make proof of existence uh, that a document has actually been approved uh, by somebody um, uh, by uh, putting that hash into the blockchain. So everybody's looking at the same document that has been approved. It's timestamped and the <laughs> metadata behind it is always the same because when you change one space uh, and put it back, the hash becomes different, what he, he, he said. Okay, so um, that was introduced. So we were selling uh, stuff to our clients and then uh, we were looking into smart contracts uh, in, in late 2016. Um, we thought, okay, okay, this is pretty cool, Ethereum made, so can we make, make a non-financial agreement with a smart contract? So we, we run into all these kind of problems because actually it's not suitable, really not suitable for make it, uh, make it anything else than a, non a financial agreement. So we came up with the idea called life contracts and the technique about it, he's going to explain a little bit more about it. So let's talk about these three type of uh, contracts. First of all, we've got paper contracts. Everybody knows that, that's just text written for humans. humans. The rules in there are ambitious, so you can discuss them, agree or disagree. The whole contract is stateless, it's just the rules that are defined. And of course, it's private. You've got a copy, I've got a copy, that's it. Nobody else needs to know. Then uh, Vitalik came up with smart contracts, which are something pretty different because they were intended for computers. You write them in a programming uh, language and they're uh, compiled to be interpreted by computers. They use unambiguous uh, rules, so there's no discussion possible. They're just plain hard facts that are on the blockchain. Smart contracts are stateful, they contain data and the data can change. And of course, they're public. Each node that runs Ethereum is anonymous and each node needs to be able to run your code. So it also needs the data to run that code. That's something important to keep in, uh, keep in mind. Well, we came up with something, something new called live contracts. A live contract is both interpretable by a human and by a computer. We say um, we're gonna store events on the blockchain so you get an uh, unambiguous uh, past. Those events cannot be muted uh, later. However, they can be disputed. So you can say, okay, you put that on the blockchain, but I think that's false. Um, they can be both public, you can just put something on the chain, but they can also be made private through public-private uh, encryption. And they have a deterministic state. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So what is that, deterministic state? We have two things. First of all, we've got the rules, and then we've got the log. The log is everything that happens um, which have, have something to do with the contract. Both things are stateless. Those are just things, those are just facts that live on the chain. 
However, if we put those two together, we can determine the state. We're going to take an exam example. Um, there are some rules that say if you steal a sausage, you have to pay 180 euros. If you don't pay that within 10 days, the police is going to come and they're going to arrest you. So let's take a look at the log. The log says that Hank has uh, been arrested for stealing a sausage three weeks ago. Two weeks ago, he rec received a fine of 180 euros that he needed to pay. That's it, there's no more information in that log. Using the rules, we, not, we can now determine what's going to happen. So we see the rules, the rule says you need to, be, to pay within 10 days. We see the log and it says nothing happened after, these, uh, after the fine was, uh, was sent, which was 14 days ago. So we can be sure that the police is going to come by and get Hank <laughs> from, his, uh, from his house. This this Hank? This hmm? With him from his house, sorry. Never up to date. It's got a little hang from his uh, from his house. Okay, of course, this is a pretty simple example. Let's have a look at an actual contract. So let's first talk a little bit about smart contracts. A smart contract is nothing more than a computer program. A computer program that can control assets, then you think like things like money, and it controls that on the blockchain. Such a contract is self-executing, so it sees some data passing by on the blockchain, and it goes and it runs a specific action. It's very important to know that a smart contract can only manage the, the assets it's given control over. It cannot touch anything else. On the, on the chain. And this is really, really important because it's impossible to enforce any rules if the um, smart contract doesn't control any assets. Any party can simply ignore the smart contract. So let's uh, take for example a non-compete cause which you can find in almost any um, labor agreement. The non-compete cost is being created by the employer and we're going to ask the employee to sign it. What you see is that the employee has to pay the penalty, in this, in this case 30 ether, right away when creating the contract. If he does not pay that uh, right there, there's no way to get it from him later. Um, well, I would say this is the problem. If you go and work for a company and say, okay, you can work here, but we've got a, a penalty clause and we need you to deposit first $10,000 before you can, can come here, work here, that's, not, that's clearly not going to work. So how about life contracts? Well, life contracts are something completely different. It works like a flowchart where any action, either manual or automated, can trigger a state change. A state change is a transition from one state to the next. Let's take the same example. So the, the labor agreement is signed and this, um, this NDA comes into uh, effect. We're at the first uh, state. The non-compete is being honored. At some, uh, at some time, the employee decides to leave the company and start his own company. Fine, no problem uh, there. However, after, after a couple of weeks, the employer is noticing that a lot of clients are leaving uh, his company and closing their accounts. And they're opening accounts with the uh, ex uh, employee. Well, he says, hmm, this is not right and I, I believe that the non-compete has been breached. So what he does is he sends that notification onto the blockchain, tri triggering the state change uh, to non-compete uh, breached. At that point, 
all kinds of systems, city stations, <laughs> and take action. Um, the ex-employee gets a notification, hey, we think you've breached a non-compete. The IT department gets a message, hey, you need to make sure that you keep the data on his old computer and his laptop uh, and his phone, etc., etc. Also, of course, the um, ex-employee gets an option. Hey, do you accept the term and do you confess that you've actually breached this non-compete? In that case, he simply has to pay the penalty and um, we go back to non-compete uh, honors. There's no dispute, so no lawyers has to, has to come into play here. On the other hand, he may also say, no, what are you talking about? I haven't breached anything, I'm gonna dispute it. Well, in that case, the lawyers get involved and we're gonna take this to court. So, we can see that a life contract would be really helpful for organizations, but that, that's not it. Yeah. It looks like really good for corporations with uh, all kinds of agreements uh, going on there, but it's actually pretty useful for a lot of, a lot of more. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yep. It's actually for everybody, because let's take, for instance, governments. Um, by making not only agreements, but also the law into flowcharts, it becomes understandable for everybody. So not only the lawyers understand what is happening, what would and could possibly happen next, but also just a normal human being, citizen of a um, nation. Um, so you can take actions yourself by, let's say, paying that fine um, and don't need a lawyer for that. You only need the lawyer when you're going to dispute something. So lawyers will get a totally other job uh, from our opinion, and they will be coming into uh, into the, uh, into a later phase. Um, also, judges are presented with one common truth. Um, they have all the facts locked into the uh, chain of events, what has happened in the past, and all the disputes and all the time which which are really consumable for judges is like. One party is presenting facts uh, this way, and the other party is presenting facts this way, but he has now one common truth. So, these, uh, it can do a lot more cases in the same time. But also, what a really important thing is, it's going to be understandable for computers. By breaking law into really small pieces of computer rules, it becomes understandable for computers. The parts uh, like uh, uh, getting the fine from your bank account if you drove too fast, but putting you in jail is something. If you if you if you made a murder, is something uh, the police needs to do. So that's a human action. You can never digitize that. So it's impossible to put that ever in a smart contract. You could do that in a live contract. Okay. So what is all? Um, yeah. But one of the biggest things also solves is the most money-burning control mechanism in the world, called bureaucracy. Let's have a look at that. Okay, why did we even invent bureaucracy? Is that we, we have a, a bureaucracy because it, it mitigates fraud. Like, the, more, the longer the paper trail is, the more people involved, the harder it is to change that paper trail. So this picture, like a lot of bureaucracy, but not too much fraud, would be the Netherlands. Uh, in maybe another country, let's say Sierra Leone, this would be opposite, yeah? Um, but it also means really inefficient systems, like a lot of checks and balances uh, need to be built in there, making the, the, the system really inefficient, slow, making communication like practically impossible. But putting this inside the blockchain as a mathematical proof of work, you've actually um, made it possible to eliminate bureaucracy, but keeping um, a, a, a really efficient system and mitigate fraud. Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide. Is this something that will happen in the far, far future? No, it will be not 
that, that there are a lot of clients already that are actually using this. You don't need um, singularity, uh, uh, artificial intelligence to let this work. <laughs> you can let this work today. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, it's time for Q&A, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm, I, would be, I would be interested, uh, can you shortly describe the use case for Albert Hyde, for example? Yeah. How are they using the live contracts? Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, there are a lot of people working at Albert Hang, which are like uh, student, low students, so girls and boys go to school. They're like 13, 14 years old. What happens a lot is that they uh, don't show up at work. Okay, there's a really big bureaucracy progress, like big inefficient pro process, like uh, trying to fire these people. It takes a long time, uh, you have to go to HR, UFA, a lot of uh, system steps to be taken. But 90% of all these steps can actually be digitized and can be automated into uh, flowcharts. And these flowcharts, putting that as protocol into the blockchain, represent a state, everybody has the same truth, and you can automate the applications connected to that. So, but these and students have to comply with those uh, those rules up front. They have to say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to stick to these rules. That's okay, that's, that, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's a contract. So yes, they need to agree with that. I think an, an important part about this and why we use the blockchain is that there are certain procedures you have to uh, follow. You have to give them warnings. You can't just say, okay, today you're fired. Well, putting those warnings in the blockchain, that means that nobody can dispute if the warnings were given or not. Can I ask something? Yeah. How, why do we need such a complicated, sophisticated technique to do something? Very, 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 very simple. You, you could say, I'm gonna, just going to use a database. Sure, but then if you take Albert Heijn, for example, if they really want to fire some, uh, some people, and there's going to be a dispute, they can simply just add some records to the database, backdate it, and fine. Nobody will ever know, and nobody can ever find it, find it out. But then are these people paid in meters? Sorry? Then are these people... No, no, so um, that's, so that's the difference between the, um, uh, the smart contract and the live contract. With the, with the uh, smart contract, we say every company <coughs> has got a responsibility, and it's up to them how they're going to execute that. So Albert Heijn will just pay that in, uh, in uh, euros and put that uh, proof of that transaction, which can simply be a hash or something else, are going to put that on the blockchain. Ethereum, but it's just really expensive and we're not using much of Ethereum at all. So we're working on our own blockchain solution uh, running uh, on IPFS because we're storing a lot of data um, and having that, having that on every node is just going to be too, uh, too expensive. So, so are the participants anonymous on the blockchain, or are they? Is there no, no, because, because if you want to take this to court, you cannot, you cannot be uh, anonymous. So everybody is, uh, is is known. Every party is known, but the data is encrypted. So uh, people have nothing to do with this contract. They, they, they don't see anything. They see so, let me get this straight. There's actually personal data encrypted on that blockchain? Yes. Yeah. Hashed, right? Not no, they were actually, actually there and actually encrypted. So, what happens? It can't be erased. What happens if in the future that encryption mythology is breached? If that encryption... Uh... It, it depends. So every, every kind of encryption works within a set of assumptions. Yeah. So what if in future it is breached? Well, it can... The same problem as you have now when a encryption thing is, is uh, breached. But I think the cool part of it is uh, the, the blockchain of uh, IPFS yeah. is that you split the data into billion parts, but nobody has the actual full thing of the data except for the parties who trust each other. So okay. if I would make a contract with you, I would have the full set of data and you would have the full set of data. Mm -hmm. But the blockchain would have 
let's say one two hundred of that data and all the thousands of other nodes also have that. So you can hack one of the nodes, uh, uh, get the, uh, the, 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 the hack for the uh, encryptor and the decrypt the data, mm -hmm. and then you have a line of text which is Maybe. not understandable. So that would not be, let's say, an address. It would be, it would be uh, let's say, a distributed set of data which needs to be put together at the end station, yes, at the client. Because, because oh, okay. it's first encrypted and then split up. So you okay. Need you need all the parts. Still, if that would happen, it would be a huge, huge problem, but it would be a solvable one. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a slightly different question. You know, this, uh, this trademark for live contracts, it's a dynamite uh, trademark to have if you actually do. I take it out that because uh, cash, cash flow uh, startups don't have the money to divert to actually go do the paperwork for trademarks, right? Okay, I don't, I don't know that's how specific they tell me, but I'm damn sure you don't have the trademark in all worldwide jurisdictions, right? No, no. I bet there are all sorts of places in the world where I can yeah, 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 take the trademark. Just, okay, just like Because yeah, yeah. again, to the extent, you, camera. To the extent camera. you do have that trademark, if at all, that's it's it's time camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, live contracts, yeah, that's, I'd love to have that trademark. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, okay, hopefully you guys do have it. I, I'm not quite sure. Anyway. <laughs> Next why question. Did, yeah. Why did you trademark it anyway? Well, basically because it's trademarkable. Um, there, nobody uses it. It's, it's also, actually, trademark is, is alt O and 538. So it's, you, you, you can find that to any word whether you're bluffing or not, actually. Right? Why, why did you shoot the dog? Because it's shootable. Yeah. Okay. You, yeah you can, why, why nobody uses the terms together. People use live, people use contract. Mm -hmm. But that's one word, nobody uses it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's they do have it. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of mine. You, you, you grabbed it, you grabbed it, you grabbed it, grabbed it if you did it. Yeah. Yeah, are there some other questions? <laughs> Do you know the project Materium? The project where Fine Kuta is involved as well? And it's an no. experiment where, no, not an experiment, it's a project where people try to create a, a platform whereby legal parties and smart contract creators come together so that yeah. smart contracts are not only readable by computers but also yeah. uh, they will be sort of translated so that there are more, there are more, yeah, yeah, there are more a couple. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a couple of those, but. You, you think they're fundamentally flawed. Um, it's a totally you, different system. If, yeah, because different. if you if you say if you take away uh, the fact that a smart contract can um, can manage uh, assets, if you take away that it's possible, you just have a very expensive computer program. Yeah, and besides that, you always you always have a human factor in place. You need to change tons of laws which are out there in every nation and yeah all well, smart contracts might be a really good idea for financial agreements they actually are but for any other type of agreement they're not yeah i think you look at this from a, a legal perspective did you already check it out it took from a consumer perspective like the employee out there hey. Um, well, as we said, we're actually running this in uh, in production um, for somebody as employee of, of the Albert Heijn. Okay, it's something they're they're being uh, submitted uh, to, but it does have uh, clearly a lot of uh, advantages for uh, for them because they can no longer be bullied by the big part by the big uh, or company saying that they did something that they've never uh, never done. And also, if you look at other, other consumers, the fact that you can take away a lot of this bureaucracy, a lot of this stress in the process really helps them and make things cheaper. And that's what consumers also like, just, just the yeah, money market. Can you like, give an example of that? Like, in other yeah, cases, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the, yeah, yeah, first, first thing, for me, good example. Uh, it's a company uh, I started in 2000, 2012. Um, uh, normally, notaries uh, you need to, to have like a BV or a sound levings contract. Uh, you need to go to a notary, pay them a couple of thousand to make this uh, a piece of paper and write it into the chain of commerce, right? So, so we're talking about BV. Yeah, yeah, creating a BV. Well, they change the law to make it easier. Because, you know, well, we, we exactly, so they change the law to make it easier. Started exactly the starting date, uh, 1 October 2012. Was the kickoff of Firm 24, uh, automating the uh, uh, intake process of creating that BV 
uh, writing that into the Chamber of Commerce and only have that notary stamping the deed and telling uh, the guy who is actually incorporating, hey, you know, sure, these are the consequences of having a BV. Do you really want it? Yes. But all in automated processes, like from the identification until the signature, can be digitized. So basically, yeah, for the consumer, it just lowers pricing. We have first room for one more question. Yes. Oh. If you have your own blockchain, how would you secure it? Or do you have money yeah. on it? We don't, we, don't, we don't have our own. Oh, I thought you said earlier. Yeah, so it's going to be the, our, own, our own chain, but it's going to be built on top of uh, IPFS, which already has encryption, sharding, etc., etc. So it's just for us to do the actual chain of the hashes. Okay, thank you very much you for... Very much. for uh, so, as you might have noticed, we've run out of time.